G'day. So today I'm going to respond to this Living Waters Should Christians Believe in a Flat Earth documentary. So I only have three major problems with it, the theology, the science and the logic. So I'm going to deal with each of those as they come up and I'm just going to play sections of the video and then give the answers to all of them. Here's an interesting question. Is the Earth flat? Do you think that question is ridiculous or do you think that I'm actually ridiculous for believing that the Earth is spherical? If the question is ridiculous, then you're not doing science because you should be able to challenge your beliefs. If not, then it's just a dogmatic belief. It's not actual science. Believe it or not, there are millions of people on this globe, oops, that actually believe that the Earth is flat. On this video, we're going to be exploring the reasons why so many people believe this. Oh, and by the way, that whole moon landing thing, yeah, they think that was a hoax also. So right from the start, this is just as the world would do it. And this is pretty poor for a, a supposedly Christian documentary. They're starting out with the way the world does with ridicule. So you can automatically tell from the beginning that they're not, it's not about science because they're trying to say that we're wrong and make us look ridiculous up front before they even talk about any of the points. I give you the evidence of what, of what you just said, we should see if the Earth is a ball, but yet you persist in believing the Earth is flat because you're going to make up an explanation to explain this away. I mean, you asked for evidence and I gave it to you, but you're not willing to accept the evidence when I give it to you. It's got a video of them showing up a flat earther um, without actually presenting any evidence and making it look like they're right to begin with. Again, no science is done yet. This is ridiculous. Now, normally, I wouldn't have given two seconds of thought to the flat earth claim. But when I heard that some of my brothers and sisters in Christ within the church are actually promoting this theory, well, I had to find out why. And yet, ironically, they never come to the reasons why. They never explain why we believe what we believe. And again, he said, I wouldn't have given two seconds of thought. He's not willing to question it. So it's not science. It's not knowledge. It's a dogmatic belief that has been instilled in him. He's been indoctrinated and they've already begun from the beginning of this so-called documentary. They have begun the exact worldly satanic indoctrination process. This is not science. Today, we're dealing with the ultimate conspiracy theory, something you wouldn't expect in the 21st century. In fact, it's something that you wouldn't expect in any century for at least the last 2000 years. It's the belief that the Earth is flat. It's not spherical, but totally flat and circular with the North Pole in the middle and the South Pole goes around the edges with high ice walls surrounding it. They still haven't talked science, right? This is the third guy who said the exact same thing it's the ultimate conspiracy theory. It's a loaded term. So yes, I am a conspiracy theorist. And if you, if you are a Christian and you have the book of Revelation, you know there is a conspiracy. And it's not just a theory. They're using loaded terminology in order to bolster their own position without doing any science. And they're calling us ridiculous. We are told that the moon landing is fake or the photographs if ever taken of the Earth is Photoshop. All the photos of the Earth taken are Photoshop. Look at them. All right? Well, here's the guy who does it. All the images we have of Earth are Photoshop, but they have to be, but they need to be. Well, just look at them. The, the continents are different sizes. Oceans are different color. The land's a different color. You look at the, the footage, the, apparently NASA footage of the dark side of the moon passing by the Earth, and the Earth is rotating. Notice how the clouds don't move. Every pilot, government, whether it's of a country or a tiny village, whether they are enemies or friends, they're all united with this one thing, to hide the real shape of the earth. No one believes that. That's, that's not the way we look at it. Not, not everyone's in on it. Not everyone has to be. Even within the scope of NASA, say 400,000 people who were involved in the moon missions, a lot of those people are just, someone is going to come to them and say, I need this component made. You make that. And they would. They don't know what it's for, they don't know it's being used, they don't know the bigger picture, they don't know that it's going to be used in a, in a studio and not sent to the moon. They think it's being sent to the moon because that's what they're being told. They would be sold the same lies. You don't need 400,000 liars. That said, the number one thing that Jesus warned about in the last days was deception. Paul said deception will run rampant in the last days. Jesus said many false teachers will arise and deceive many said, when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith on the earth? Your vast majority of people aren't going to care because they don't see the ramifications of it. 
they will go into the also the second group, which is people who have been told the earth is round, seen controlled opposition or seen people ridiculing flat earth like these clowns and just going, oh, I don't want to be one of them. I don't want that stigma. So they don't even look into it. Then there are those who are just being told and they believe what they've been told. And there are those who will look into it, but find false information that is spouted on the, the mainstream media. So the tiny little village, it just shows his complete ignorance on this subject, complete ignorance, because no one actually believes that. So this is a, a, a false argument or what we call a straw man. They're setting up a false picture of flat earthers and then tearing down a picture that isn't even true. And they're gonna do that right through this video. Those who believe this tell us that the flat earth is kept secret by the military, the space agencies, NASA, all shipping companies, all airlines, including transnational companies that move goods around the world, odometer manufacturers, the navigation industry, every astronomer, whether amateur or professional, physicists, satellite TV providers, and every employee of all these companies are all involved in this global conspiracy. Not just for now, but for as long as these industries have existed. Global conspiracy. <laughs> You'd have to be pretty stupid to come up with that thought to think that everyone's in on it and they're all trying to hide it. Most people, they're, they're told it and they believe it and they don't question it. So they're not looking around going, is the earth flat? Is that proof of flat earth? Is that proof of a globe? They're just going, okay, the earth is round, whatever. I got a life to live. But I've, I've seen a video of a pilot who said it was 25 years after she left that she realized, hang on a second, I've been using these instruments that show the plane's attitude, which is the angle of attack, and they were always level. You, you should be flying nose down constantly around a, around a globe Earth. She goes, oh, she didn't even question it until 25 years after she left as a pilot. So not everyone's thinking about this constantly, so therefore not everyone is hiding something. Most people just don't care, and again, it's because they don't understand the consequence of it, because it's being worked in stages. When people ask me for evidence of the globe, I have my go-to. The first thing I talk about is the shape of the Earth's shadow during a lunar eclipse. I took these photographs in January of 2019 during a uh, lunar eclipse. This is during the partial phase. Two different exposures. I got a short one here and I got a long one. When you take a long exposure, you overexpose the lit part of the moon. And you can see the shape of the shadow here. It's a, it's a, it's a circle. It's uh, quite a bit bigger than the, than the moon is. Turns out if you do the conventional cosmology, the moon is 2,000 miles across and the Earth's shadow is about uh, 5,000 miles across. And um, if the Earth is, a, is round and flat, it could cast a circular shadow, but only if an eclipse is visible at midnight. But if you have an eclipse occurring at sunset, it's gonna be looking at a shadow cast of something flat like this. It's not gonna look a circular at all. All this is showing is his ignorance, again, of flat Earth. He's got the model sitting in front of him where the sun and the moon rotate above the earth beneath. So even at midnight, no, there would not be a circular shadow cast on the moon from the earth because the, moon, because the sun never goes beneath the earth. It goes above and around it. So I'm gonna deal with his point in a second. What I'm saying here is they clearly haven't done any research whatsoever because even with the model in front of him, he still gets the idea wrong. Yeah, good science. The only shape that consistently casts a circular shadow regardless of its orientation is a globe. This argument is not original to me. The first mention I know of it, it goes back to 350 BC. Aristotle and in On the Heavens use that very argument. And I still think it's one of the best because people can see this for themselves. Now flat earthers are gonna argue that the, uh, the lunar eclipse is not caused by a, uh, the shadow of the earth falling on the moon. I say, fine, what, it, what does cause it? And I don't get an answer. They tell me they, they, they know it's not the Earth's shadow, but they don't know what it is. <laughs> so what I'm going to do here is, um, first off, his line of reasoning here, they can't answer me, so therefore I'm right, is, is garbage. It's a logical fallacy. Later on in the video, he is going to play the God card. He doesn't have an answer, but he still assumes he's right which is completely contradictory to the point he's trying to make here that they don't have an answer, therefore he is right. So the actual flat earth answer to the scientific query here of the shape of the shadow, first off, a shadow has no substance. It takes on the form of whatever it's cast onto. Doing this is like saying, oh, if you cast a shadow down a flight of stairs, therefore you're a zigzag. Like, 
No, it's the shadow is being cast onto something that is clearly round. Therefore, the shadow takes the shape of what it's being cast onto. It becomes round. The other side of that is there are many astronomers, well, within the last 2000 years, who have said that it's not the Earth. And one proof of that is that in the last 2000 years, at least 50 lunar eclipses have been recorded where the sun and the moon were both visible during, during the eclipse. And so therefore you can't have the earth in the middle and the sun up here and the moon up there and all be in a straight line where that's obscuring that. It's, and then they'll just tell you, oh, it's light refraction. That's basically an optical illusion. Don't believe your eyes, believe science. One of the problems that Paul was facing during his time writing in the New Testament was what uh, a group called the Gnostics. Gnosis, knowledge. The Latin for that, scientia, science. So I'm not saying all science is bad. I'm not saying all scientists are cultists, but science is being used as a religion with on the a false basis of false facts. And these guys are taking the word of that religion over against what the Bible does say. Basically, astronomers have been saying for hundreds of years, the Royal Astronomical Society, so that's kind of a big deal, June 1815 said, quote, we may well doubt whether that body which we call the moon is the only satellite of the earth, unquote. In the report of the Academy of Sciences for October 12th, 1846, and again for August 1847, the director of one of the French observatories gives a number of observations and calculations which have led him to conclude that, quote, there is at least one non-luminous body of considerable magnitude which is attached as a satellite to this Earth, unquote. Sir John Herschel admits that, quote, invisible moons exist in the firmament, unquote. Sir John Lubbock is of the same opinion and gives rules and formulae for calculating their distances and periods. At the meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in 1850, the president stated that, Quote, the opinion was gaining ground that many of the fixed stars were accompanied by companions emitting no light. The changeable stars, which disappear for a time or are eclipsed, have been supposed to have very large opaque bodies revolving about or near them so as to obscure them when they come in conjunction with us. And that would make sense given that you can still see stars during the day sometimes. Like stars don't always just come out at night and Therefore, there must be something blocking. You can't just say that it's uh, it has to be dark enough for their light to make it from outer space because we can see them sometimes during the day. Other days we can't. It's inconsistent. And so that that's not a consistent explanation for it. He goes on to say, we have now seen, seen that the existence of dark bodies revolving about the luminous objects in the firmament, the firmament, has been admitted by practical observers from the earliest ages, and that in our own day, such a mass of evidence has accumulated on the subject that astronomers are compelled to admit that not only dark bodies, which occasionally obscure the luminous stars when in conjunction, but that cosmical bodies of large size exist, and that one at least is attached as a satellite to this Earth. It is this dark or non-luminous satellite which, when in conjunction or in a line with the moon and an observer on Earth, is the immediate cause of a lunar eclipse. You say, well, you have to make up stuff. Well, if you're a heliocentrist and an evolutionist, then you would also believe in dark matter and dark energy, which have never been proven to exist and apparently comprise 96% of the known universe, or the universe itself. So I think it's 74% dark energy, 22% dark matter, 4% matter. 96% of their cosmology is based on theory that has not been proven. So to, to say that these astronomers whose job it is to do astronomy, to look at the stars and the sky and stuff, have actually found these sort of things, and there is evidence and they've got, you can calculate formulae in their, their periods, you can actually make predictions based on these things, that is science saying that 96% of the universe is comprised of things that have never been observed or tested is not science. That's ridiculous. If you walked into a courtroom with a hundred witnesses, you say, judge, I've got a hundred witnesses. And he's like, beauty, this should be easy. It's like, well, when I say witnesses, I've got four witnesses and then 96 people who have a really good story. How is that going to, that wouldn't hold up in a court of law. It shouldn't hold up in science because science is based on what is testable, observable, and repeatable, which this isn't. 
And the fact that what we can see without being told about some optical illusion actually contradicts this story. So I'm going to go with the evidence, not the story, because the Bible says that in the last days, evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. P.S. The Hebrew word NASA. Sorry, the word NASA, if you look it up in the, the original Strong's Concordance, means to deceive. NASA means to deceive. It's actually pronounced Nashor, which has been changed in the in the recent ones, but I'd say that would have been changed because people actually found this out. Oh, and the word plane in Greek means to deceive. NASA and planet, both in biblical languages, mean to deceive. Turns out, I don't have time to talk about it now, but there's abundant evidence to indicate, scientific evidence, that indeed a lunar eclipse is the Earth's shadow falling on the moon. So there's a bit of denial of reality uh, going on there with that. So there's a bit of a denial of reality. There is abundant evidence. I haven't given you any. I don't have time to give you any, but he's right. Good science. People understood the Earth was a globe more than about 2,000 years prior yeah. to Columbus. Aristotle, writing in 350 BC, wrote on the heavens, and I've, I've read part of that, and I've read the relevant part. Pythagoras in the 6th century BC argued that. So certainly by the 4th century BC in the West, educated people and most other people knew the earth was a globe. So some preachers today have an issue with people doing what this guy's doing, which is quoting a, a bunch of secularists, and rightfully so. I mean, he's, it wouldn't be a problem if he was just quoting proper scientists, but these are actually pagan secularists for one, and he's quoting against what the Bible says. Putting it in context, which they're going to make a big deal about, putting that in context here, this video is should Christians believe in a flat earth? He's supposed to be talking about the Bible, which they haven't even touched on yet, and when they do, they get it really wrong. Are you going against the, the agreed on opinion? Yes, because they're wrong. I don't care how many clowns this, this dude quotes, they're wrong. That doesn't make him right by quoting famous people. 10,000 people being wrong doesn't automatically make you right. But the thing is they know that a lie told often enough is believed to be true. That's, that's what brainwashing is. And so they, what they do is they give you one story a thousand times over and don't let you research the alternative and they ridicule you for researching the alternative. And because you're self-conscious, or well, most people are self-conscious, they're going to care about that and they're not going to look into it for fear that they're going to look silly. So it's, it's a pretty easy trap to set in today's world. And again, these are, these are supposed to be Christians. The skeptics started arguing that uh, the Bible and Christianity had held back progress. And uh, one of their major exhibits in this was that the, the church and the Bible said the earth was flat and people 500 years ago proved otherwise. And here was a chance for the church to redeem itself by getting in on the ground floor of Darwinism. And he's just saying the Bible and science held back progress. I know he's not saying the Bible held back progress. He's saying the church did, but that's, that is what he's saying. And that argument actually worked very well, as it turns out. You found all these people capitulating to, uh, to Darwinism. So that's how that got started. Now, in the 19th century, there were some Christians who, instead of refuting that false argument, picked it up and ran with it. Darwinism came on the back of heliocentrism. And he still doesn't see the connection here. If they didn't discredit the Bible first, then they wouldn't have been able to pull this Darwinist nonsense. It had to come in heliocentrism first. Why? Because the Bible does say that the earth is fixed, the earth is flat, and God is watching over it. God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. No. No, it's not, apparently. Apparently, we're just a pale blue dot rotating around a star in the middle of this vast nothing, fleeing away from an explosion that happened by random chance. So heliocentrism, we all revolve around their sun god, Helios, and you can see these occult sun worship symbols all over the earth. Obelisks are one of them, and they're everywhere. If they started with Darwinism, which is the ultimate attack, which is on your humanity, your being, your being special, created in the image of God, if they had started with that, the attack would have been obvious. So they started with the universe. The earth is not special. We're not in a special place. And even like he said, they didn't even, they didn't prove Darwinism. They just used the, the globe earth to they used their first lie to bolster the second one. 
So instead of refusing, refusing the false argument of Darwinism, they picked it up and ran with it. And now most educated people know that we evolved from a common ancestor with monkeys. Right? Educational consensus. Isn't that how it works? Maybe if they had have argued, if they had have actually argued the, the flat earth to begin with, they would have ended up in that position. But he's, he's refuting his own ideas there that Christianity should have argued against this lie because the lie became science. And he doesn't see that. The lie became science with Darwinism. All we're saying is those people are consistent. What, what are called conspiracy theories are just consistency theories. The same people that lied to us about that lied to us about this. The same people that lied to us about that lied to us about the moon landing. The same people that lied to us about Darwinism also lied to us about the shape of the earth because it's the same people pushing both. Darwin, Charles Darwin was not an atheist. You can see in his pictures, the depictions of him. This is the symbol of an Egyptian uh, the secret keeper. What was his name? Hippocrates, the keeper of secrets. That is an ancient Egyptian god. The Egyptians would worship Ra, the sun god. Right? So heliocentrism into Darwinism, which is based on a sun worshiper. These are obviously connected, obviously. Conspiracy theories are actually just consistency theories. It's my understanding that you have two camps. You have, first of all, the Christian camp mm -hmm. uh, that uses scripture as their foundation for why they believe the earth is flat. But surprisingly, and I could see why some may say that, I'd like you to take us into that, but I know that there are others who are secularists who would say, no, um, that we don't believe in the Bible, but we believe the earth is flat. It's not just two camps, there are actually many, many camps. There's a lot of division among the flat earth movement. I've, I've gone to three flat earth international conferences and I saw that the very first one. Uh, people were hardly talking to each other. Some of them, some of the presenters were there with a, with a, with a what I think is a biblical approach. Others were saying, oh, we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna yeah. do the science. So it's really fragmented. The one thing they're agreed on is that the earth is flat. And beyond that, there's a lot of disagreement about models and so forth. <laughs> Again, no science in that, just ridicule. Oh, there's a lot of disagreement. You've got heliocentrists who believe that we share a common ancestor with monkeys. Show me a division in flat earth that is of that magnitude. In the heliocentrist camp, you've got people who believe that we're created by God, people who believe that God used evolution, people who believe there is no God and evolution proves that. Yes, there are, like you said, there are secularists who, who believe in, in flat earth. And they believe that Christianity is just one among, they believe it's another sun religion, sun worshipping religion, right? The son of God and all the Catholic depictions with the halos and all that sort of thing. But it's, you say, well, there's a lot of division. Again, you, no science. So what if there's division? He's trying to claim intellectual superiority by pointing to our flaws as human beings and not dealing with the science. He will remain blind to the end of this video and even to this day not because he can't see, but because he claims to see when he's actually blind and therefore his blindness will remain, just like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Since we have so many scriptures that talk about, you know, the earth can't be moved. And I know you had mentioned this about geocentricity in, right. in your book and as well as your, um, one of your recent discussions on YouTube. Um, how do we reconcile that when the Bible says the earth does not move, it's immovable, it stand, yeah. you know, it stands still, but so then this verse would imply that the sun and the moon stopped. Yep. It's not just phenomenological. So um, when I say that the sun rose, the moon rose, the sun set, the moon set, the sun moves across the sky, the stars spin around, I'm not being schizoid, I'm not being contradictory at all. And I'm not using just phenomenological. In a real sense, it really is moving. So whether Joshua thought the earth spun, whether he thought it was a globe, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Uh, if he thought the earth was flat, if he thought it was a globe, he could still command the same thing that I probably would, knowing uh, having a different cosmology. Except commanding something like that requires faith, which you clearly don't have because you don't believe the word of God. Getting back to your question about, about the uh, earth not moving found in the, in the Old Testament and the Psalms and so forth, you got to realize that the, the English word move can mean many different things. Uh, I, I, I will not be moved many times refers to I'm steadfast in what I believe. Doesn't mean I'm, I'm not ever gonna get up and walk away from this chair at some point. The same word, Hebrew word used for um, uh, move there, the earth shall not be moved, the, uh, the psalmist writes and says, I shall not be moved. Unless you appeal, uh, believe, subscribe to the David-centric model, you have to argue then that, that David did get up and walk about at that point. So it's not talking about a, a, a spatial sense of not moving, it's talking about something else.
So he's done exactly what he said that they, they did earlier. Uh, they said, oh, it's not, it's not the, the earth casting the shadow, but they can't say what it is. He said, um, it's, that's not what moved means. It means something else. And then he just dismisses it. So according to his logic, he's wrong. And according to actual logic, he's wrong too. Is the earth going to remain steadfast in its beliefs? The word moved has many different meanings. How many meanings does the word move have for an inanimate object? If an inanimate object is moved, it can only be moved spatially. The earth shall not be moved. Therefore, the earth does not move. God said what he meant and meant what he said. So what you're saying is God is either too stupid to communicate what is actually happening or he's lying to us. Which is it? Or this, this, this third option, third option, I don't know, I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, you're wrong. The Bible is not a random collection of verses that can be interpreted individually from the rest of Scripture. Somebody once said, never read a single Bible verse by itself, right? Because all of Scripture is interpreted in totality with the rest of Scripture. But when you read a single text, it can easily be taken out of context and become a pretext for a proof text. So when we approach the scriptures, we must keep a few things in mind. First thing is we must interpret it literally, but not just literally, but how does that coincide with the rest of scriptures historically? What is the historical setting, right? What did the original author have in mind when he reached out to the original audience? What did he have in mind when he was dealing with culture and customs and traditions? And once we put those two things together, we jump on to the next area, which is grammar. Does it grammatically make sense with everything that is preceding that passage and the post passage? What comes after it? And finally, when you grab a hold of all three of these, you will have to put it conglomerately with all of scripture. This is the synthesis. Does it make sense? When you grab a hold of the four of these and you put them together, guess what you have? Context. But when you read a single verse all by itself, it will almost always be taken out of context. Okay, so let's do that with the verse he was just talking about in the previous section. Um, the earth shall not be moved. So, um, grammatically, directly before that, one of these instances says, the earth stands on a firm foundation, it shall not be moved. So grammatically, that makes sense with the flat earth. So what, uh, it took me to watch through this twice to realize what he was actually saying here is that we're taking verses out of context to support our position. <laughs> That's what he said, never read a single Bible verse by itself. At the end of this section, he's going to read one Bible verse by itself, and that is going to be the only Bible verse they use for the entire their entire documentary, their entire side of this documentary. And at the end, they're going to try and sell you a tract, which says science confirms the Bible. On one side, it's got a scientific principle. It's got two columns. One side, the scientific principle. On the other side, a single Bible verse. So they're contradicting themselves here. Um, so grammatically, yes, it makes sense. The earth shall not be moved spatially because it stands on a firm foundation. So grammatically, it makes sense. Um, culturally, doesn't matter because this is God talking to people who live on the earth. And then you go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is not dependent on culture because the context of it is that um, if man was created on day 6, then man did not exist for day 5, day 4, Day five, four, three, two, or one, right? And so all of this is divine revelation. So it's saying what was the original author's intent to his original audience? Well, the original author of Genesis chapter one was God. His original audience was Moses. And the intent was to communicate how he created the earth because he knew the, every, the Bible is an amazing book because God knew it, it proves God's foreknowledge in that every single heresy that has ever arisen has already been refuted in, in the Bible. And so Genesis chapter one, the order of events was given because he knew about this, this globe earth nonsense and he knew about this heliocentrism and these long ages that were going to come. And right up front in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is how he did it. 
So grammatically it makes sense, culturally it makes sense. Throughout the story of the Bible, when Joshua commanded the sun to stand still in the sky, yes, that's consistent because the Bible says that the, the sun rises and passes through its circuit like a runner racing its course from one end of the heavens to the other. And the Bible says the earth is fixed, it shall not be moved. So in the context of, of the story of scripture, Joshua telling the sun to stand still because it is moving. Makes sense. Makes sense grammatically. So everything he's saying here, he's trying to say that we're taking verses out of context, but you put in every single test that he says we need to make and, and ours stands up and theirs falls again. Imagine if you would, you open up Google Maps and you hone in on the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and you come in so closely to where all you see is water. What are you left with in a conclusion? That the earth is only water. Well, the same is true when we look at an individual verse and we begin to think, well, there's four corners. Well, that means, well, the earth must be flat. No, my friends, that is not the case, and that is contextually wrong. I'd just like to point out the, the opposite of that. Um, with water, because of course the ocean is curved around the ball, um, anytime we actually visually see water, it's flat. Everyone knows that water seeks and maintains its level. And yet, what do they do? They apply it to a, a scale that is so large that we can't actually see it, and they tell us it curves, and we're like, yeah, sure. We believe it. Why? Every Any test that can be done will show that, uh, that water seeks its own level. Why don't you take it as more logical on a large scale that water is seeking its own level too? And apparently um, there's this magical force called gravity that the moon's gravity is causing the ocean's tides and yet uh, rivers, pools and puddles are not moved by this. So the moon can actually differentiate between oceans and rivers. And it only its gravity only affects the oceans, but not the rivers, not puddles, not pools. It's all this convoluted nonsense, one lie on top of another to explain another lie, because people keep finding out their lies, and so they have to make another lie, or admit that they're, they're lying to us. If you take the pillars of the earth and four corners, earth has four corners, it stands on a firm foundation, talks about the pillars of the earth on which it stands. It shall not be moved. God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, not sphere. But even if you want to say, oh, earth looks like a circle from outer space. Well, where's above? Because if God sits enthroned above a sphere and there's no up and down in space, then God would have to sit in a sphere in order to fulfill that verse. Is God's throne a sphere? And is God a sphere that sits on top of his throne sphere that sits outside the universe sphere that's covered, covering our sphere? No, the simple, straightforward God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. So flat earth makes sense of all the verses put together. So he's taken one verse out of context, but you do what he's saying you should do and put it in the context of scripture, of all of scripture, and his argument falls over. <laughs> yeah, you probably know where I'm going with that, and I'm not going <laughs> to say it. That's something they would do. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God. Uh, side note, asterisk, uh, all scripture is breathed out by God, except for the verses that talk about flat earth, because we believe in science and that contradicts the Bible. And so we're going to say that we believe in the Bible when we're going to spend an entire documentary refuting what the Bible says. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work therefore therefore i have taken one verse out of context and that is the only verse we're going to use in this entire film don't take verses out of context because it can become a pretext for a proof text to ignore the proper context of any given scripture is to set yourself up for failure file Now the flat earth model generally accepted by most flat earthers looks like this. You've got a round disc and with a dome over top, it's kind of flattened. At the uh, middle here is the north pole of the earth. You can see uh, North America over here, South America, Europe, uh, Africa, and Australia. 
and around the perimeter you have what's called the ice wall of Antarctica. The dome rests just beyond that ice wall. These little lights going around, this is a clever little device they put together. One is the moon and one is the sun. The moon, uh, the sun goes around once uh, a day on this, this sort of model, so it's sped up. And it's a spotlight shining on the Earth, which explains why you have daylight in some places and dark on others. Over here, it's going to be dark because the sun is over here. Over here, it's going to be daytime. And the moon moves at a uh, slightly different rate, about 50 minutes uh, slower than the sun does like that. Now, the dome is spinning around like this above you and so you have stars you can if you zoom in close you'll see these little stars here and the idea is those stars will spin around like that and that introduces a wealth of, of issues and difficulties just on that quickly i'll just add in a couple of extra points so i talked about that the north pole is in the center on a flat earth and south is all points around the circumference of the earth true and an evidence of that is compasses Right, I'm in the, the southern hemisphere. If I get a compass, it's going to point north. Apparently, the compass is meant to point to the closest and strongest magnetic force, which for us should be the South Pole. But there isn't one. If you even want to go to the South Pole, um, they'll take you to a sign, which apparently isn't the South Pole, but is 300 meters away. And for some reason, you can't walk 300 meters to the actual South Pole, but they, you can take a photo in front of a sign. Like, there is no South Pole. There is no South Pole star. Um, Sigma Octantis, if you look up, if you actually do research on it, it says that it's a hypothetical star that has never been observed. And even when they, they, they like to say that the Earth shall not be moved is a metaphor, which again, inanimate object, it can't be a metaphor, can't be interpreted anything but literally. And yet, even the verses that are metaphorical, like uh, talking about creation testifying to the works of God and, and their sound shall be heard throughout all the Earth. Well, this, this north pole in the center with the south around it is actually how speaker magnets work. So the, the, the earth is essentially shaped like a giant loudspeaker and their sound is heard throughout all the earth. So even the things that aren't, that I wouldn't say are meant to be literal can still fit with the flat earth and not with the globe. So that's, so that's some pretty good consistency there. And then also, who is it, the British, British, uh, I keep thinking Avenger, it's not Avenger, Challenger, the British ship Challenger that circumnavigated Antarctica took three years and over 69,000 kilometers. If you look at the actual size of Antarctica on a globe, that's enough to go around Antarctica, I think, seven times. You think you would have worked something out or Antarctica is the giant ice wall. You see, um if they're all going in a round like this, then there's a circle that the stars are tracing out like this, a circle. Now, if you look at a circle from, uh, from the, the axis of that circle, if I got a plane sitting here and there's a circle, if I look straight at it, it will look like a circle. But if I tilt that axis at all, it won't look like a circle, it'll look like an ellipse. And um, so if I place myself anywhere but the North Pole of the Earth, say over here in North America someplace, or over here in Europe or Asia someplace, then what I'm going to see is this sort of shape, an elliptical pattern right there. There'll be the North Star somewhere near the middle and the sky going around like that. Now I simulated this in our planetarium at the Creation Museum in Northern Kentucky. I had the stars spin around to point at the top of the dome. I placed my camera up uh, near the bottom of the dome, but uh, off to the side near the edge. And I opened the shutter for 30 seconds. And as you can see, you're producing these elliptical sort of patterns. Now, if you're right on the axis, which I did for the second photograph, I got in the middle of the dome and shot a photograph straight up, you'll see you get circles. So if this is the correct model, if the Earth is flat uh, disk with a dome spinning around like this, the only place that the stars will make a circle in the sky is right at the North Pole of the Earth. Well, the thing is, every night the stars don't look like that. They look like this, no matter where you are. So where I live, it should look like this if this model's correct. The fact that it looks like this where I live is a very good strong evidence that this model is not correct. So notice, he said he went to the edge for this. I'd like to know how far away the edge is. I mean, these things obviously aren't huge, but he's gone to the edge and that's not a... If you compare the two pictures, 
the ellipse is not that drastic a change from the perfect circle, given that this is a, a small planetarium dome and the perspective is going to be far exaggerated here. So if you can imagine if the, the dome was, you know, 10,000 times bigger than this, then that, that difference is going to be negligible. Computer simulations, man. We've spent the last two years indoors based on computer simulations, contrary to the evidence. North America and things like that, that wouldn't have that much of an effect. You could still get pretty close to this, depending on the, the shape and size of the dome, no matter where you are. All right, here's, here's some star trails that don't look like that. Here are some star trails that don't look like that. Here are some star trails that look like that. And let's talk about, oh, I don't know, the entire Southern Hemisphere. North Pole is not the only place where that had happened because of the, the size and the perspective, but on a globe Earth, if the Earth was a spinning globe, where would you ever find that position? So he's saying that even where he lives, he can see that. And yet, while the Earth is spinning around, if the Earth is pointing at Polaris, the North Pole Star, and he's spinning around, what is the Earth also doing? It is rotating around the sun. What is the Earth also doing? The Milky Way galaxy is rotating, and so the Orion arm that we are supposedly in is also rotating around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. What is also happening is the because of the Big Bang, the Earth is shooting through space at 500,000 miles an hour. So if you add up all these speeds, when would you ever see that, even at the North Pole? When would you ever see perfect circles in Star Trails? It, it proves the Earth is not spinning, or if the Earth is spinning, sorry, then you can't have the Earth revolving around the sun because that would elongate this shape and turn it into kind of this curly thing, particularly if you're not standing at the North Pole, which he says he wasn't, he was in North America. But then you've also got pyramids that were built four or 5,000 years ago with chambers pointing to significant stars and constellations that still do that now. How is that possible? if we're shooting all these thousands of miles through space. All this is, is manageable by perspective on a flat Earth, not on a globe Earth. It, it doesn't make sense to me that, because we believe as flat earthers that God created heaven and then Earth, right? And mm -hmm. then the Holy Spirit was on the face of the deep. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no potential face on this globe, but there is a face on here, which is there on the top. I think you're assuming that the word pane, uh, which is the word for face uh, there in Genesis mm -hmm. 1, uh, must refer to something flat. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that. It means, it means a, a surface. Mm -hmm. It means a, the interface, the edge of something. If the Earth is flat, then of course that would be flat. If the Earth is a globe, then it's going to be a, it's going to be a sphere. It's going to be a shell, mm -hmm. as it were. There's nothing in the Hebrew word itself that tells you anything about the geometry of the situation. It doesn't have to be a flat mm -hmm. surface at all. You're, you've, you've got a face on your, mm -hmm. all of us have faces, yeah, yeah, yeah. but our faces are hardly flat. Yeah. It has a lot of shape and depth and roundness to it as well. It just simply means that the surface that you have is yeah. a good way of putting it. God spread out the earth across the breadth of the earth. God set a compass on the face of the deep. Everyone knows the compass draws a circle. So even if you want to butcher the Hebrew, just like you butchered the Hebrew word for move back there, you're just getting in more stuff that should help you to get to the truth and you still don't see it. Because you're just explaining it away because you've already decided beforehand, I wouldn't give two seconds of thought to the flat earth claim. And so in their arrogance, they remain in ignorance. When we think about Jesus and, and him talking about returning and how Jerusalem will come down, um, and then he's going to open this great abyss, where does he come down? Along with that is when it says every eye will see him mm -hmm. as lightning flies. So, so, I mean, logically, it's like, well, how could everyone not see him unless they're all in the same plane mm -hmm. of existence? In other words, how is the guy down in Australia going to see Jesus at the same time? You know, the guy up in, in Jerusalem would see him. Down and up are defined in terms of the earth. So down is this way and up is that way, no matter where you're on the earth. So Jesus, Jesus comes back, he comes down from above, from the heaven. I don't see a problem that on the globe earth at all. The, um, as far as every I shall see him, uh, I, God is God. Yeah, I don't know how we'll handle all of this. There it is. God is God. I don't know. I don't have the answer, but I'm still right. Even though you're wrong when you don't know the answer. However, point out, it says even those who pierced him. And by my reckoning, the guys who pierced him have been dead for 1900 years or more. 
So how is that possible? How could they do it? Uh, you got to read the whole passage there and get the whole context. That's one that just jumps out at me that unless you're going to resurrect these Roman soldiers, uh, how can you literally fulfill that part? Well, I reckon you need to do a bit more reckoning because even those who pierced him is clearly talking about the people group who pierced him, who have been in blindness in part, right? The Bible says that blindness in part has been put on Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so when he returns, even those who pierced him, that group will see him. Every eye shall see him from all parts of the earth. That does not work on a globe. Jesus said, as lightning shines in the east and is seen in the west, so shall the coming of son of man be. That works on a flat earth that does not work on a globe. So if you put everything in context, flat earth is biblical, globe is anti-biblical. And that is the whole point, that is the reason why it was introduced, to discredit scripture. Well, be I mean, also the book of Revelation yeah. speaks about the two dead prophets lying in the streets yeah. and, and every, everybody will see it. Well, how do you do that? Uh, on a flat earth, that's a problem, unless you call everybody in it to, to this town, city and see it for themselves. So it doesn't say every eye. Let's see what it does say. So Revelations 11, beginning at verse 7. When they finish, so this is the two witnesses, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, which is the abyss, will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now, one big thing with the, the heliocentric model is that beneath the earth, they say, is molten lava to the core. Whereas the Bible says, now this is a very important part of the flat earth, that hell is actually beneath the earth. And if you want to say that's metaphor or something, Korah and his family was physically swallowed into the earth. alive. So that works on the flat earth model that the Bible clearly portrays. Hell is beneath us. The heliocentric model, we are not in a special place in the universe. We are not specially created. Heaven is not above us. Hell is not below us. There is infinite e expanse of emptiness above us and there is molten rock below us. Death is the end of all things. Can you see how much this model contradicts the scripture? So this beast ascends, comes up, out of the bottomless pit. Which again, bottomless pit in the Greek is abusa, abyss. So the beast ascends, kills the two prophets, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse 9. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their de dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations. So this can easily be portrayed on TV, on the news. And then those from who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts because these prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So the people will will see because they have prophet uh, power to call down fire from heaven and to send plagues and all this sort of stuff. They have power to do physical things that anyone can see. And yet, when they are killed, those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies. It doesn't say every eye. The other verse says every eye shall see. Anyone who wants to see their dead bodies can. You can't use this to prove what he said before, because what he said before was every eye. This mentions every people group in a sweeping broad brush stroke. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. So even those who aren't in there, who can't see their physical bodies, will realize that when the plagues have been stopped and they're not being killed by fire from heaven, they can rejoice. Or if they've heard on the news, or they've heard through the grapevine. Right? Anyone can see. This is not every eye shall see. This is everyone will know, but not everyone will see. They're different. You know, I always, yeah. and I guess I still do answer that question. Like, okay, they had no concept of television back then, right? Uh, now it'd be live on well, CNN. Well, I, I could use that same answer for the question, you know, how can people around the globe see the Lord return? You can, True. the yeah. sa same answer applies there. I, I, I guess it would, I guess it would. What about the people in the tiny little village? The tiny little village that's hiding the shape of the earth from us. They don't have TV. What about the Amish? TV doesn't apply to that. TV does, TV can apply to the two prophets. TV cannot apply to every eye shall see. So again, straw men, false arguments, garbage logic, no science.
we are here today on the shores of Skegness. Here you see what they call race bank wind farm. I'll just point out as I go here, those, look at the, the turbines. The turbines are perpendicular to the water. Just pay attention to that. 91 turbines placed in the sea that covers an area bigger than 10,500 football pitches. Each turbine is 100 meters high above the sea level and they are about 28 to 36 kilometers away from the shore. What's interesting is that each turbine has a yellow platform about 50 meters high from the bottom up, which is just perfect because that's going to help us decide if the earth is curved or flat. If the earth is curved, then 28 kilometers should give us a drop of about 61 meters. If it's 36 kilometers away, that should give us a drop of about 101 meters. That means we shouldn't see any of the turbine at all. Well, we'll ignore the height of the blades for now. Before they even do the experiment, it's already wrong. If you remember the overhead shots, and if you remember water, the water was flat and the turbines were perpendicular to the water. If you saw a drawing of water curving, you'd probably think it was ridiculous, as you should, because it is ridiculous. Water seeks its level and maintains it. If the earth is curved, or more to the point, if the sea is curved, if water is curved, contrary to what water actually does, and if the turbines are perpendicular to the water, the turbines should be leaning away from the viewer. The closest wind farm you can see from here is known as the Lynx Offshore Wind Farm. These are about 6 to 11 kilometers away. As we pan to the left, we begin to see turbines behind the Lynx Offshore Wind Farm. These are part of another wind farm called Race Bank. These turbines are much further away. They are between 30 and 35 kilometers away. If we do the math with the curvature of the Earth, we calculate that we should only see the top two-thirds of the closest turbines. And that's exactly what we see. The yellow platform is missing for each and every one of them. That's the bottom 15 meters of each turbine. The fact that the base is not visible tells us that the Earth is curved. This is an observable, testable, and repeatable experiment that can be done by anyone at any location that has turbines built with these specifications. The turbines are parallel to each other. If they are parallel to each other and perpendicular to the water, therefore the entire water is flat as water is, and the turbines are standing upright, and therefore this is due to perspective, not due to a dip in the earth. They haven't even done the maths correctly, they haven't done the science correctly, and they've misinterpreted the evidence. Again, they've just proved themselves wrong. If they would even look at the way they did the experiment, you don't even need to bring the maths into it. And the other side of the calculations is they haven't measured how much of the turbine they can see. There's no maths here, there's no science, and the logic is garbage. And we say, say if I look at a ship that's around like, I could, uh, we could say like it's like out there like 20 miles out, and I could, I could still see the full ship. I shouldn't, which, 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 which I shouldn't be able to. But the thing is, oftentimes you don't. I've done an experiment a couple of times with okay. this myself. Here's just one I did a couple of years ago. It was informal. I wasn't planning to do this. I was in South Florida, and there's a cruise ship sitting here. Now I have, I've reproduced these two photos at different scales. Very important. That is crucial to this. I reproduced these two photos at different scales. That destroys his entire argument. First, when because in the first one over here, the, uh, the uh, uh, ship was much closer to me. In this one, it was much farther away. It moved farther out. This one's so dark looking because there was a cloud over top blocking the sun. Here, the cloud had moved and the sun was shining on it. But this was clearly much farther out when I took the photo. If you look very carefully on the hull here, there's like a wave-like thing on the side there, poking up there. Look over here, you don't see it at all, do you? Mm. And, uh, same ship? Same ship. <laughs> Um, I, I could I could use that same picture and um, say that um, the reason why it looks like it's uh, say like uh, sinking in sinking mm -hmm. down would be because um, in in the in the in the ocean especially in the ocean there's a lot of water in the atmosphere mm -hmm. and what water does when you um, what water does the effect of water in the atmosphere is it bends. It, it bends uh, things down. So, so if I were to put a pencil in a cup of water mm -hmm. and I look at it through a clear glass and I look at that pencil, it magnifies it and it bends it down. But the, that's because the glass is curved. If you had, a, if you had just a plate glass, a, a, like, a, like a fish tank there, and uh, looked at it straight on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't end up with a magnification at all. This guy, all right, he's sitting down with a backpack. So he's clearly not in for the long haul. 
He's clearly nervous. Danny is beating him because he's a more seasoned debater, not because he's right. Right? This guy is clearly awkward when he talks, when he speaks. He knows what he's saying. What he's saying is right. So Danny sort of debunked his examples of the pencil in the water, but that doesn't change the fact of light refraction to do over the sea. So his example of this over the sea is correct, and Danny doesn't argue with that. He just argues about the pencil and then says, therefore, I'm right about this ship. And like he said before, they were reproduced at different sizes. In order for this to be legitimate, he would have to zoom in on the second one until the ship was the same size as on the first one. So perspective answers this. You don't even need light refraction. This is just perspective. And so you got the horizon line, which is line of perspective. Everything above the line descends to the horizon, including the bottom of the ship. What has happened here is in the first picture, he said it was closer. It's closer and so more of the ship is visible because of perspective. Whereas in the other one, it was clearly much further away, he said. The ship, even though it is much further away, is still upright. It's not tilting away over the curvature of the Earth. But do you know much about optics? I don't want to pull rank on you here, but have you, uh, have you ever studied optics? Don't want to pull rank. So what would happen if uh, he was talking about biology and Professor Richard Dawkins pulled rank on him? I, I, I know about like perspective and um, how I'm talking about water affects... I'm talking about refraction. Um, I'm talking about indices of refraction, Snell's mm -hmm. law, this sort of stuff. I warn you, I'm a physicist. I'm an astronomer. I've studied this stuff quite a bit. Yeah. And yet you're still really wrong. That's sad. Pull rank, rank. The average flat of Earther is not. They've seen some YouTube videos with, you know, the pencil and a glass of water. Okay, so your, your claim to intellectual superiority is that you've gone to a satanic institution, spent probably tens of thousands of dollars you don't have, and wasted years of your life regurgitating lies to a moron. And somehow you're smarter than us because we haven't done that. Sure, I mean, if we want to say that people out there are deceiving us and- Do you read the Bible? Evil men and imposters or seducers will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Many false teachers will arise and deceive many. In the last days, deception will run rampant. Well, I'm sure if you want to see people are deceived. <laughs> Why can't it be the other way around? Why can't it be that Satan is deceiving people to think the earth is flat? <laughs> Glad you brought it up. Let's look at the numbers. What is the tilt of the earth's axis? 23.4 degrees. Therefore, the deviation from the truth of the flat Earth, 23.4 degrees from vertical, leaves 66.6 .6 degrees deviation from the truth. That's interesting. What is the speed of the Earth's rotation? Eight inches per second, which is what? 0.6666666 of a foot per second. That's interesting. What's the curvature of the Earth? Eight inches per mile squared, 0.6666666 of a foot per mile squared. That's interesting. What's the speed of the Earth's revolution around the sun? 18.5 miles per second. Multiply that by 60 is 1,110 miles per minute, which is also an interesting number, but we'll leave that for the moment. Multiply by 60, 66,600 miles per hour. That's interesting. Arctic and Antarctic circles are at 66.6 .6 degrees, as above, so below. I could go on, so I will. NASA tells us. All right, so NASA tells us. So if you look here, it's got the, the NASA link. Derivation and definition of a linear aircraft model, even in the blurb on the search page, a linear aircraft model for rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth is derived and defined. NASA.gov. Now you get the actual report, you click on the link, it goes to this. Um, there's the front and it's got the, the PDF down here that you can download. You can see the number up here is the same. Click on that. It said, so in the abstract, where, where that comes from, um can't see it there it it says it's a flat non-rotating earth concluding remarks this report derives and defines a set of linearized system matrices for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat non-rotating earth moving on nasa again this is another one you can look up General equations of motion for a damaged asymmetric aircraft. You go down and click on the link, it opens this. 
There it is. You can see, in order to analyze the dynamics of damaged aircraft, the dynamics dynamic equations of motion must properly reflect the underlying physics. What are those underlying physics? Next page. In this paper, the rigid body equations of motion over a flat, non-rotating Earth are developed. So both of these are NASA documents. And then I'll just chuck an extra one on here. This is a, a Christian, I'm guessing Catholic, if he's using Latin here, to God alone be the glory, soli Deo gloria. This is for his uh, masters. So he's trying to get, this is his master's thesis in aeronautics and astronautics. So this is for a system design method with application to a targeting system for small unmanned aerial vehicles. So this would cover drones and missiles. Drones and missiles. And it says here, furthermore, defense related projects require a strict acquisition process that requires companies to submit pro proposals. The system design method proposed here is geared towards the proposal stage of design and and is aimed at enabling objective informed design decisions. As such, the method uses the system's properties in a utility function-based evaluation to determine the best alternative. Toward these ends, the method defines criteria critical to the system's evaluation and functions. To go down a bit further. The system's properties are derived from relationships with the components' properties and between the components and their environment. Utility function based. Three targeting methods were considered. Assuming a flat earth using digital terrain elevation data using range data. So DTED was the most helpful. Flat earth was the second most helpful and most accurate of these methods. And that's for his MIT master's degree. Tell me, why is it that when we look at the sun, it always looks the same size, depending, regardless of whether it's summer, winter, it's always the same size, but you're saying sometimes it's further away and sometimes it's closer. Something that's several thousand miles further away would kind of reflect on the size, wouldn't it? Especially if it's 30 miles big. And I mentioned before how much like a worldly documentary this is. And you can see that in the people that they've chosen to argue with. So the guy with the backpack, clearly not a seasoned debater. This guy, he's confident in what he's saying, but he's clearly not very articulate. And so the flat earth position, they're deliberately picking people like this so that the flat earth position automatically seems ridiculous. I mean, he's obviously more intelligent than this guy, but this guy is better spoken. And so he's going to seem right. This, for a supposedly Christian documentary, this method is disgraceful. Disgraceful. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Isn't it unwise to come up with a theory based on something we don't know? E equals MC squared. <laughs> C has never been measured, sorry. The two-way speed of light has been measured. But it is assumed that light remains constant. So the theory of... When I, oh, as soon as I started looking into relativity theory, I realized exactly what it was. It's not science. It's the philosophy of relativism introduced masquerading as a science. Everything is relative, except apparently the speed of light, which is absolute. So if you look at Einstein's equations on the speed of light, there is a two in front of everything. Why? Because the speed of light has never been measured in one direction. Wouldn't it be unwise to say we don't know, therefore it's flat? Did he say that? Is that what he said? We know the Earth is flat, but I can't answer that particular question. But I do have enough knowledge to know that it is flat. That is what he's saying, not, oh, I don't know, therefore it's flat. Straw man. Another straw man. It's ridiculous. Look at his face. I've got you. You need to come over to my side. I put you in a tiny little village to hide the shape of the Earth. Have you heard of Aristoteles? He, he measured according to the um, shadows that comes, according to the shadow on a certain time of the year, he measured that it was a certain angle which gives them the curvature of the Earth. Well, there are two possible explanations. First, we could have a flat Earth with the sun that's small and close by so that the light hits the second well at an angle. Or second, we could have a curved Earth with a sun that's big and far away so that all the light comes in parallel, but only one well at a time is lit all the way to the bottom. 
turns out with just two wells, there's enough wiggle room for both explanations to fit our observations. Eratosthenes only had two wells. But what if he had added a third? With a third well, it doesn't matter where the sun is. No flat Earth model can explain the angles of all three shadows. But the spherical model explains it all. Another objection I have to this model is that uh, notice that the sun is always above the horizon. You can draw a line from any spot on the surface of the uh, Earth to uh, that either the sun or the moon. They should always be above the horizon. But if you pay attention on a clear, clear day, you can see the sun rise, you can see it move across the sky, and then you see it set. And uh, how does that happen? And they try to argue some sort of idea about perspective and all this sort of stuff. They uh, take a perspective, it can be illustrated by these two diagrams that I have here. Uh, one of them is just a hallway I happened to see in a hospital last year. So how does the earth rise and set on a flat earth? As it gets further away, it descends like on that picture until it disappears behind the horizon. When it's rising, it's actually coming from behind the horizon it's going in a straight line, just like those lights are, and it's getting, as it comes towards us, it's ascending, and then as it's going back, it's descending. I don't know why he's arguing, how, how is that possible? He's just showing a picture of how it's possible. The doors appear to get smaller as you go down the, the hallway, don't they? Notice that they get closer together, even though they are evenly spaced. Again, that is perspective. I illustrated this with uh, some wiffle balls. I put them evenly spaced, I think about a foot across, apart from one another, as you can see from the um, tape measure there. And then after I took the photograph, I uh, drew a line on, on these things and showed that they can have a convergent point off in the distance. Again, notice that the balls get smaller appearing. They're the same size, but they simply look smaller. And they get closer and closer together, even though they're evenly spaced. Now, what do you think is going to happen if the sun is moving around like this? That's in a, a very small, isolated eye level experiment to try and disprove a sun that is three or four thousand miles overhead passing across the sky above us, not at eye level. So the effects that he's talking about here would be, should be that drastic at eye level, but with that, a scale that large and with that kind of perspective, no, it shouldn't. So this argument does not count. It doesn't refute anything. Around the sky, it's going to be like right now, if this is the sun over top, of it's going to be noon here on the west coast. But after a little while, it's going to get farther and farther and farther over to the side. And uh, as it does, it's going to get farther and farther and farther away from us. From what you see in these photographs, the sun then should appear to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it ought to slow down because it's moving at a constant rate. These things are evenly spaced here. It means you've got to move a little slower, apparently slower and slower. But if you watch the sun and do this right, what you'll find is that number one, the sun moves at a constant 15 degrees per, per hour rate. That would seem to disprove this model altogether. The sun moves 15 degrees per hour. Why is that significant? Because if you look at the revolution of the earth around the sun, if, this, if the earth rotates once every 24 hours, so I'm just going to call them east and west for the sake of the illustration, right? You've got the sun in the middle. Let's say you're in New York. New York is facing east towards the sun at midday. 24 hours, full rotation where it's going to be facing directly east. But it has moved around its revolution slightly. Six months time. So it keeps moving 24 hours facing east, facing east, facing east at midday facing east at midday. Six months time, sun is still in the middle, New York is still facing east at midday, but the sun is on the opposite side. Therefore, it should be midnight in New York if the Earth is 24 hour rotation. Well, they just change the calculation. A rotation is actually 23 hours, 59 minutes and four seconds. And so that, you know, gives a, a slight change. But if the sun moves 15 degrees every hour, then 360 degrees divided by 15 equals exactly 24. This cosmology shoots itself in the foot. 
but you'll also notice that the sun stays, stays the same size. Now, you will sometimes see flat earth videos out there that show this huge sun in the sky, and as it gets lower and lower in the sky, it gets smaller and smaller and finally tiny. They say, aha, here's your evidence, it gets smaller. The problem they have is they grossly overexpose those light sources. As the sun gets low in the sky, it gets fainter and you get less and less brightness. If you really believe the Earth is flat, please keep it to yourself. The words flat Earth are synonymous with the words very low IQ to this world. What are the words banana man synonymous with to this world, as far as IQ goes? They already think we're unscientific without us giving them another stumbling block between them and the gospel, one that's equivalent to believing the moon is made of cheese. Jesus didn't say to go into all the world and tell them about the shape of the Earth. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And this will do if we care. Equivalent to the moon being made of cheese. Again, ridiculing. And it's saying we should change what we believe or not talk about certain things because the world doesn't like them. Now, how Christian is that theology? So the flat earth is the stumbling block. He said, all right, all right. <laughs> go to answers in Genesis. And what do they say? The reason, one of the reasons it was founded is because people are leaving the church en masse because of their belief in evolution, discrediting the Bible. And he's saying that flat earth is a stumbling block. The flat earth is what the Bible teaches. God saw fit to put it in there. So that would actually be a foundational stone for the gospel. Because what did Jesus say? If I've told you of earthly things and you have not believed, how can you believe when I tell you of heavenly things? This makes sense. Why would flat earth be a stumbling block? It's not because if people realize the earth was flat, they would realize they're being lied to, then they would have to ask the question, why? And they would go, well, if the Bible is correct about the earth being flat, then maybe Jesus was onto something. But if the Bible, which it talks about flat earth, which it does, if it talks against evolution, which it does, it says the creatures reproduce according to their own kind, then if science is right, the Bible is wrong, and therefore the spiritual aspect of the Bible can't be trusted. If I've told you of earthly things and you have not believed, how can you believe when I tell you of heavenly things? This is the nature of faith. right? Faith means trust. Trust is not blind. Blind faith is naivety. John, in writing his letters, he says, I write to you the things I have seen and heard and touched with my own hands, so that you may believe. I am giving you empirical evidence of what I have done and seen empirically in the real world so that you can have faith for what is unseen. Like if someone came to me and said, oh, um, your brother beat up my best friend. I didn't see that event happen or not happen. So I'm taking, am I going to trust their testimony or not? Or am I going to trust in what I have seen of my brother and say, well, I've known my brother for over 30 years. So even though I haven't seen that based on what I have seen and heard with my own eyes and ears, I can say in full assurance of faith, your friend deserved it. Faith begins with what is seen and then transfers into the unseen. That is where faith actually applies. Because if you can see it, it's not faith. But if you can't see it, your faith needs to be founded on what has been seen. Jesus said, if I've told you of earthly things, which he has. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He started with the earthly things. If I've told you of earthly things and you have not believed. So if you distrust what can be tested, science, if you distrust what can be proven or disproven, how can you believe for something that can't be proven or disproven? Like the existence of eternity in an afterlife. Flat Earth is not a stumbling block to the gospel. Globe Earth is. And the proof of that is actually in the world. We'll say, well, the Bible's garbage because 
the, the earth has been proven. Everybody knows that the earth is millions of years old and that we evolved. And no matter how much evidence to the contrary you show them, they're still going to stick with their belief. That is what causes them to stumble because what they see determines their faith in what they can't see. So the Bible's right again, and you're wrong again. Now, Ray often likes to talk about the conscience, saying, I'm bypassing the intellect going for the conscience because that witnesses to God. But, well, if that's the case, then what's the point of this? This is, what was this? This is a waste of time. If the only thing that matters is the conscience, then why make one of these? Why is it not the conscience Bible? The Bible says that the conscience can be seared as with a hot iron. So based on that, if the conscience is dead, does that mean that there is no proof of God? Yes, it does. Based on that, yes, it does. But that's not what the Bible bases it on. The Bible bases the reality of God and the judgment of man, the reality of the judgment of man, that man is without excuse, not because of conscience, but because of creation. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I'm not sure if you want to see people who did deceit. Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For God has shown it to them. The truth is manifest in them. They know the truth because it has been shown to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not know God in their conscience. They knew him because creation testified to him. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him nor as God, nor were thankful. Nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish, foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And then it goes through the debasement of their character. And then in verse 28, and so after this, this debasement, debasement, they, their mind becomes dull, their hearts become dark, their character becomes debased. And then, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, full of deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, so they can look at the, not, at the evidence and not see it, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So it, the Bible shows the, the, the exact progression of exactly what this is meant to do. And it's not because of the conscience, like Ray says, it's because of creation, like the Bible says. So this is not undermining the gospel at all. In fact, more people would believe the gospel if they could see that, that the world is lying to them. Because the Bible not only tells us about the flat earth, it tells us the truth about the earth, about the things that can be seen, so therefore the things that can't be seen are more trustworthy, but it also tells us what the opposition is doing. And what do you do? Supposedly you believe in God. Supposedly you worship and have faith in God. When what are you doing? The Bible is God's revelation to us. Jesus Christ is the word made flesh, manifested. And it says that he is the image of the invisible God and has fully exegeted or revealed him, manifested him to us. So the, the Bible is God's divine revelation. So in distrusting and teaching other people to distrust the clear word of God and replacing them with the traditions of God-hating, insolent, unbelieving, blinded men, fools, You've taken the word of fools and placed it above the word of God, detracting from the character of God, because the Bible says you have exalted your word above your name. 
God stakes his reputation on his word and you are sitting there disproving his word to other people who actually believe it and you claim to worship God. And in detracting from his word, you have detracted from his revelation. And what you reap, and the Bible again says even what you are, you will reap what you sow. And so since you have sown detraction of the revelation of God, you have reaped detraction of the revelation of God. You'll see that in Danny right here. And this is, I think this is key, why we don't pull out proof texts. Yeah. We read scripture in its totality for all things that we need. And remember, you know, scripture doesn't tell us everything we want to know about God and his workings, his dealings with mankind, but it certainly tells us everything we need to know about God and the earth and his workings. You know, the Bible is not necessarily a science book, but it is definitely scientifically accurate. Yeah. And we need to always remember that. I don't think anywhere he really reveals to us what the shape of the earth is. No, the Bible just doesn't talk about a globe earth anywhere. So <laughs> let's see what, what the Bible does say. I'll just give you a few verses. I can't go through the whole list because it's a massive list, but it will be enough to establish what I'm saying. So the earth shall not be moved, so it's stationary. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. So uh, parallel verse over here, Psalm 93. The Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty, he is clothed with strength, wherewith he has girded himself. The world also established that it cannot be moved. So it's in the context of, of God's strength. Um, I'm not King James only. I'm just using this because it's got the strongest numbers and they're going to come in handy. Proverbs 8.27, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. So this is an eyewitness account. You know, in the context, the eyewitness is technically wisdom. There are a lot of people who believe that this is a kind of representation of the pre-incarnate Christ. And I would agree with that in that uh, the word set up here, I was set up from everlasting, means to pour out. And Jesus was crucified before the world was made, but it also means by analogy to anoint a king. Wisdom cries at the gates. The gates is a place of authority. Unto you, O men, males, I call, and my voice is to the sons of Adam. So this is a matter of authority. So if we go back to Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are people that say uh, God injected long ages in here. The days are not real days and so forth. And then you get down to day six, God created man in his own image. That's where evolution um, attacks the Bible. But people say, oh, God used evolution or Adam is a metaphor. If you look at Genesis chapter one, chronologically, let's go backwards. Darwinian evolution. Before that, millions of years. Before that, right, this verse is still untouched. The millions of years starts in between these two verses. But before that came heliocentrism. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. So how does heliocentrism destroy that? Well, in the heliocentric model, earth revolves around the sun, which is a heavenly body. Therefore, earth becomes a heavenly body body and the distinction between heavens and earth disappears. So this, the attack started at the very first verse of the Bible. And if you look up the Encyclopedia Americana, the entry for Copernicus, it even directly states this. It says the traditional view held that heavens and earth, earth was a special place. I can't remember the exact wording. He says under Copernicus, the distinction between heavens and earth disappeared. And so Paul even talks about First Corinthians 15. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, right? So celestial, heavenly, terrestrial, earthly. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. All flesh is not the same flesh. Evolution. Celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. Heliocentrism. The first man, Adam, became a living being. There goes the metaphor. Anyway, so that's, that's where the attack is. And let's go back to the shape of the earth. So Proverbs... When he prepared the heavens, I was there, eyewitness. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep. So compass, circle, set, properly to hack, to engrave, inscribe. Isaiah 40 verse 22 also says, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Go to the word, uh, it means circle. And you go down to the definition of the word, Strong's, and it comes from a word that means to describe a circle. 
So there is there is no he sits upon the orb of the earth or the sphere of the earth. That that's crap. That does not allow for that translation. So he stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. From this one verse alone, and yes, I said it, one verse alone, I went, okay, the earth is a circle and he spread them out as a tent. He spread the heavens out as a tent to dwell in. So this is clearly not outer space because you can't dwell in outer space. So this is clearly talking about the firmament. Which one looks more like this description? A circle, a flat base with a dome over the top, or a ball with a ball around it. It's pretty obvious. I worked out from this one verse, I went, okay, if that's the case, he spread out the heavens as a tent. It has a flat circular base. Therefore, Earth is an enclosed system with a flat base, and therefore there is no need for gravity. That was my conclusion. As soon as I said that, I had a YouTube window open and it had the suggested searches down the side. This, it had this video in my suggested searches. This guy, I think he works for NASA, going by his videos, Veritasium is the channel. And basically he goes through and explains from general relativity why gravity is not a force. And so there is no force pulling things and moving things. And yet the irony is lost on him. He still uses the term gravity in other videos to refer to things falling to the earth and whatnot. So um, like the, the scripture I read before, undiscerning. And the other verses that say, always learning, never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Going back, he sits enthroned upon the circle of the earth. I worked out from that one verse that there is no such thing as gravity. Because I started with his word, I established the truth from his word, I worked it out from his word, and then he brought along a hostile witness to confirm what his word already said. Isaiah 66.1 The earth is my footstool. If you want to say that's purely metaphorical, even as a metaphor, that's stupid. If the earth is a spinning ball that's revolving around a sun and shooting through space. What a stupid footstool. But it all makes sense. It all fits together. Putting it in context, the earth is my footstool. If it's got four pillars and a flat base with a dome over the top and he sits his feet on the footstool. I mean, it, even the metaphors make sense for a flat earth do not make sense for a globe. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass, strong as a cast metal mirror. Literal translation. Thou hast made an expanse with him for the clouds, strong as a hard mirror. And it has to be because it's holding water above it. Praise him, heaven of heavens, and ye waters that are above the heavens. So how can there be waters above the heavens if the heavens are gas? How can there be space above the heavens, above the atmosphere, if the atmosphere is gas sitting next to a vacuum? Scientifically, that doesn't work, let alone scripturally. Elihu, have you stretched out the skies with God strong as a cast metal mirror? And God has been silent this entire book until Elihu speaks. We go to the next chapter. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Why? Because Elihu, these three other clowns that Job has been talking to have been misrepresenting God. God said, you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. The Lord appeared out of the whirlwind after Elihu spoke the truth. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who stretched the line upon it? Stretching out a line, a cord for measuring, also a rim. Which makes sense on a flat earth. You'll see the picture in a second. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, sunk down. So some other translations, Young's literal. On what have its sockets been sunk? So this is talking about a stationary earth that is fixed in pillars with a line stretched upon it, sitting above the circle of the earth with a sky over it that's a cast metal mirror, strong as a cast metal mirror. Genesis chapter 1, God called the expanse heavens, separated the waters which under the expanse and the waters which are above the expanse. Praise him waters that are above the heavens. But if we go over to the Lexham English Bible here, and God said, let there be a vaulted dome in the midst of the waters. Day four, God said, let there be lights in the vaulted dome of heaven. So question for you answers in Genesis people. Is this the answer or is this wrong? Explain to me that Genesis 1 is wrong, that the cosmology of the Bible is wrong because it is clear, it is consistent contextually right throughout scripture. I'm even going to go to Revelation here. He will go out to the deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog, to assemble them for battle. And they went upon the broad plain of the earth. 
So another translation, they went upon the breadth of the earth. What does breadth mean? They went upon the platos, width of the earth, which comes from the root word platus, which means to spread out flat. So from Genesis to Revelation, the shape of the earth is clearly seen. And then we'll go back to Isaiah to give a comparison because the Bible does talk about the shape of the earth. He just doesn't talk about a globe which he could if he wanted to. Isaiah 22, 18, He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball. Toss you like a ball into a large country. Crumple you into a ball and toss you away into a distant land. Whirl you around and round and throw you like a ball into a wide land. The land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. The word here from an unused root meaning to revolve. Properly vertigo. And uh, having suffered from vertigo, I can tell you that that is literally spinning in a circle. That comes from another word that means to move in a circle. So if he wanted to say that the earth was a ball moving in a circle around the sun, he certainly could do that. Right, so we have Peter's vision in the book of Acts. He became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. Then after this, Peter was sent to a Gentile's house. And the purpose of this the sheep with the four corners represented the four corners of the earth with the unclean things in it, which were the Gentiles. And God gave him this illustration, the four corners of the earth, representing the whole earth, the Gentiles of all the earth. So it's, it's consistent, again, with the flat earth. He didn't lower a ball down and tell him to eat off a ball, which he could have because it's a vision. It's a trance. Right down to Revelations chapter 20, one of the last chapters in the Bible, they went up on the breadth of the earth from the four corners of it. So this is an interactive map of the world. So these apparent temperature data here, the moving lines are ocean currents. So you can pull up this list, go down to Antarctica, and everything apparently moves around Antarctica in a circle for no reason. Because you go back up here and it's moving in all different directions. So it's kind of going across here, swelling back. But you go down to the project. Hey! <laughs> all right. So. Uh, I'll just look at the air for a second. Why I kind of got excited, what has happened is they've removed the azimuthal equidistant projection map, which is the flat earth map. So look, just look at these winds for a second. They're all haphazard. They're all over the place. So let's go back to the currents. They have gotten rid of the flat earth map of this. Thankfully, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. So see, AE, they have removed that. Uh, let's go back to my one. A, C, E. It's gone. They've removed the aqua azimuthal equidistant map. Why is that? So that's the globe. There's the, the winds on the globe. They're trying to hide the shape of the earth. You see that? They've literally hidden the shape of the earth. That has been removed. This is in real time. I am recording this on the 31st of December, 2022. And the azimuthal equidistant map has gone. But look at the winds. That were all haphazard before. Now they're moving in a circle around the earth. Look at that. The, the ocean's currents are moving in a circle. God has inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. And then the other ocean, then the ocean's currents are moving in a reverse circle on the inside. Moving outside there, inside there. This is inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. And the temperature data, this is the range where the sun covers in the middle of the earth on a flat earth map. However, if you go over to a globe, why is the temperature hottest at the equator if the Earth is tilted? So you compare, he's inscribed, so he has cut in, he has drawn a circle, inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. He's got a wall around there, which is a circle. The ocean's currents are moving in circles. Compare that to these ocean's currents that there is no circle on the face of the deep. Currents are everywhere, but they happen to be going in a circle around Antarctica. So is Antarctica the face of the deep? The only uninhabitable continent on the planet is the face of the deep that God was talking about. Or God has inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. As you can see, I've shown you in real time that they have removed this projection from this interactive map because why? Look how much sense it makes of the evidence and of the Bible. Look how much it backs up what the Bible says about the shape of the earth and the movements. That earth is stationary, so the temperature matches up with the path of the sun 
on the flat earth, the winds, the oceans, currents, everything moves in a circle on the face of the deep. And look at that go. See how much sense that makes on this map compared to this. They're just going, woo, it's going up here, woo, it's going down there, woo, it's going across there, it's going this way, it's going that way, it's going that way. Then you put it on a flat map and booyah. It's just all makes sense. And that's, I think, a good thing, ultimately, because if he had endorsed the idea the Earth was flat, then after people decided it was a globe, then be holding the book in, in derision, right? Because it's false. If he said the Earth was flat, then after people decided it was a globe, they would have held the book in derision. Exactly. That's what the point of the globe Earth model is, to discredit the Bible. And if, if he endorsed the idea it was a globe, long before people understood that, then they would have been in the ancient times, perhaps, been, been denigrating the Bible. So again, it's one of those situations need to know, sort of basis. Um, God just didn't see fit for us to know the, what the cosmology of the world is, how big the world, those kind of things. How pathetic is this God? This God is scared to say what shape the earth is that he created because people might not like his book. So first off, God directly challenged Job about the shape of the earth. Where were you when I laid its foundations and fastened them? So not only is he not scared of people ridiculing him because of the shape of the earth, he actually directly challenged a righteous man based on the shape of the earth. Why? Because he created it. I think you would know. Then there is the existence of Nineveh. For centuries, people ridiculed the Bible. Historians ridiculed the Bible because the Bible in the book of Jonah God sent Jonah to a place called Nineveh. And they said, well, Nineveh never existed, so it's fanciful garbage. And then I, I think it was 1890, the, the city of Nineveh was excavated, it, and it turned out it was actually a capital of Assyria. So not only was it a city, it was a major city. And the Bible records, should I not con be concerned about Nineveh? Because there are 120,000 people there. So it was, the Bible says it was a city and it was a major city and it existed. People didn't believe that. Yes, they did hold the Bible in derision and God didn't care. Because like I said, he's not, he's not afraid of people. The fear of man brings a snare, the Bible says. So why would God be scared to say anything? Especially if he exalts his word above his name. He's not scared of putting his name at stake when it comes to the trustworthiness of his word. Jesus even directly said things that he knew he would be ridiculed for, so that seeing they will not see and hearing they will not hear. Destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. Oh, three days? It took years to build this temple. He knew they were going to misinterpret what he was saying, and he deliberately said it that way to stick it to them. I have hidden these things from the wise, so that hearing they will not hear, and seeing they will not perceive, lest they turn and I heal them. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no place with me. So you've got Jews who knew that cannibalism was forbidden by Torah, then you have Gentiles who know that cannibalism is weird and gross and weird. And then they started leaving because they were offended. And what did he do? Nothing. He let them go. So, oh, no, 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 no met metaphor, 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 sorry, sorry. Sorry, come back, come, please come back, please come back, I'm scared. Don't go away. Then Peter comes to him and says, uh, dude, that was harsh. And Jesus turns it snaps straight back at him. You don't want to go too, do you? He still didn't quantify what he meant. You want to know why John was lying on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper? He goes, this is my blood. And John's like, oh, <laughs> thank God for that, right? He never quantified what he was saying. He deliberately said things that he knew he was going to be ridiculed for. And he just left people to it. And he deliberately said it that way to hide the truth from people who are like this, who are arrogant. So this is not a need to know, oh, we can just figure it out. It doesn't matter. It does matter. You are detracting from the word of God. You are detracting from his revelation. You are undermining his character. The gospel is foolishness to the Gentiles because they don't understand biblical cosmology, the earthly things. If they have heard of the earthly things and do not believe, how can they believe when they hear of heavenly things? So if God is God, then serve him. But if Helios is God, then serve Helios. 
Did we really make a video about people believing the earth is flat? <laughs> yeah, we did, friends. But look, there are two lessons that we can take away from this video. The first is, there are people within the body of Christ who love the Lord and know the Lord that believe things, well, that are sometimes actually false, but they're not salvific issues, and we need to be gracious and merciful while sharing the truth with them. Just saying, if it wasn't a salvific issue, it wouldn't be in the Bible. The Bible, it, the whole story of the Bible is all salvation. Even the genealogies are in there for salvation purposes. Why? Because it traces Adam's lineage down to Jesus Christ. That's when the genealogies stop. Therefore, even the genealogies, those very boring to read, name after name, begat, 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 that is all a salvific issue. Therefore, all of creation is a salvific issue. And other people word it this way. You probably hear this to do with evolution. Creation is a side issue. Open your, open your Bible. What's the first thing in there? Table of contents. First book of Moses called Genesis. Right, beginnings. This is the first book of the Bible. Side issue. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God put creation straight in your face. You want to call that a side issue? God calls it the first issue. Is the foundation. Like answers in Genesis like to say, Psalm 11.3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If flat earth is destroyed, what can the righteous do? The gospel is undermined. If heliocentrism centrism was proved to be true, then the Bible is wrong because they clearly contradict each other. You can't have both. And the second lesson is this. Our goal as believers is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are so many theories that we can get caught up in, but the most important thing is that we be the ambassadors we're called to be for the glory of God. Now, of course, you're not saved by believing in creation or believing in flat earth. You are saved by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven bodily and is now seated at the right hand of God forevermore. Uh, that, that is the core belief that constitutes a Christian. I did believe in heliocentrism up until probably less than 12 months ago. That said, creationism, even though it didn't save me, it did stop me from leaving the church. Because when I was, when I was 26, uh, I, I all of a sudden started getting excessively angry. And I mean, if you think of like a, you boil a pot of water and you, you sit it on the stove and it's boiling, there's all these bubbles going, you lift it up, the bubbles will die down, but it's still sitting at, at boiling point. And so as soon as you sit it back down, the bubbles will come up again. That's what I was like. I seemed fine on the outside, but as soon as anyone said anything, <laughs> I'd, I'd flare up. I was able to, I didn't say anything, but I knew I was overreacting internally. And that's the reason I didn't say anything because even when people did me wrong and I should have corrected them, I didn't because I knew it was going to come with interest that they didn't invest in. Right? So I, I left it, but I was just excessively angry and I couldn't work out why. And I couldn't, I couldn't stay in church. I'd, I'd go for a week and I just, I just hated being there. I just couldn't stand it. So I left. And I said to, uh, mum had said to me repeatedly, oh, I'm always the last to know, you never tell me what's going on. And so this time I was like, all right, I'll call mum and talk to her about it. And I called her and I said, uh, mum, I, I, I can't stay in church. I don't know what it is, but I think it has something to do with Chris. And so Chris was my little brother. He died when I was, I was two yeah, he died when I was two, uh, caught death. And uh, for the longest time, I thought, like, I never grieved it because it happened when I was two. So I was like, well, I never got to know my brother. So how can I grieve someone I don't know? And turned out that was the problem, was that I never got to know my own brother. And mum, as soon as I said it has something to do with Chris, mum goes, oh, well, actually, when, when you were a, a child, I took you to Chris's grave site and um, and you said, where is he? And mum said, Jesus came and took him. So 
I was like, well, that explains why I can't stay in church. Jesus took my brother. And I was, I was so angry. I was like, and at the time, I mean, my, my dad was a, a policeman at the time and his son died. He got two weeks off, two weeks off work. First day back, he got sent to a cot death. Not only that, but he, when he went into the hospital, the baby was lying in the exact carriage that, that my brother had been lying in just two weeks earlier. Like, what the hell is that? Because my mum is a believer. They were in the house when he died. And I, like that, I said at the time, that would be so much easier to process if there is no God. Because it's just, life's a bitch and then you die. Right? So believing in God, that was hard. And what does the Bible say? Again, the Bible is proven right here. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Because if you, the fool, you can't say in your mind, there is no God, because logically you would have to say, in order to prove there is no God, you would have to know everything. In order to know everything, you would have to either be everywhere at once or have some form of consciousness, let's call it a spirit, everywhere at once. You would have to be able to exist inside and outside of all physical spatial dimensions and time as well. You would have to be timeless. So if you want to go straight from logic, if you were an all-knowing, all-powerful, present everywhere, eternal, hyperdimensional being, then you would have a logical foundation to say that you don't exist. Hopefully someone with that much knowledge wouldn't be that stupid. A fool says in his heart there is no God. That is why atheists are so angry and bitter. You push them. It always has a guise of science. It has a guise of logic. Oh, you have faith. I have science. And why are you so angry? The Bible is proven true again. I said it would be easier if there was no God. But because I had spent extensive study in creation and realized that the Bible was the only document that actually accurately recorded the history of the creation of the earth, I knew that evolution was scientific garbage or philosophical garbage. I knew I wasn't evolved. I knew that God was a creator and I knew that the Bible was the only book that accurately represented that. Therefore, I couldn't logically deny the existence of God, so I couldn't leave. Even though, no matter how hard that was, and so no matter how hard that was, it was the truth of creation that anchored me, that kept me from walking away, that kept me from becoming a fool in my heart because my mind knew better. Not because of my conscience, not because of the gospel necessarily. I got saved through the gospel, but it was a salvific issue because if it wasn't for creation and literal interpretation of Genesis, I wouldn't be here. Yes, it is a big deal. Satan knows this, and that's why he's pushing heliocentrism. If his word is truth, then you need to change your belief. But if not, then let me know. Because like the Bible says, stop doing that, it's not a Bible. Like the Bible says, if Christianity is not true, that we are to be pitied more than all men. Right? The Bible straight up says that Christianity is the worst religion on the planet. Unless it's true. God made this wild statement in Genesis chapter 1 that he put the sun in the sky. If that's not true, like I said before, either God is too ignorant and stupid to be able to communicate the way that he created the earth, or he is a liar. And therefore, because the earthly things cannot be trusted, the heavenly things cannot be trusted. And so if, if what the Bible has said about the flat earth is wrong, prove it. And then let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. 